Hello again, and uh, welcome back to the Hebrews class. Uh, we're in chapter 12 today, and uh, I, I hope that you're getting a lot of good information out of this and a good encouragement uh, to keep on keeping on. And uh, uh, I just want to start with a word of prayer as we begin this study. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the great words that you provided for us. Father, thank you for Jesus, and he's the uh, finisher and perfecter of our faith, Father, and uh, and uh, the one who has taken away our sins, and Father, that uh, they are remembered no more. And Father, I pray that that uh, as we study these things, that we would uh, be encouraging, uh, that we would see all the great things that you have done for us. Uh, Father, we thank you most of all for the the greatest thing that you did is to send your only begotten Son. Uh, to die on the cross and to be raised from the dead uh, so that we might walk in newness of life with him. Uh, Father, uh, uh, thank you for these words. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know uh, about you, about your personal heroes, if you have uh, those personal faith heroes that you were uh, uh, associated with. Um, I, I look back and I had a few of those. And uh, I, I, just too many to, to name, um, but I, I look at uh, people like Hugo McCord and, and Stafford North at Oklahoma Christian University, or back then it was Oklahoma Christian College when they were there. They were, uh, they were spiritual heroes to me. I looked at their faith and about their strength and how much they cared for other people and how much they cared for God and how much they cared for his word and the things that they taught us. Uh, they're great men, and uh, I've, I've had some elders in my life uh, that uh, have been such a strength to me, uh, and uh, heroes to me. As I look on uh, their steadfastness and their faith and their perseverance, I, I look at uh, men like Brother G.D. West that was uh, uh, one of my elders over in uh, Richland, Washington, along with uh, Hayden Smith. These were uh, great men to me that uh, were very, uh, very uh, uh, instrumental and very uh, good uh, um, in, encouraging examples to me and their faith and how they they kept on keeping on and how they encouraged others. Uh, they were they were very strong. Well, maybe you uh, um, are a new Christian. Uh, maybe you don't uh, have any personal uh, heroes of faith yet, but we just finished a chapter, uh, chapter 11 last week, that talked about a, an incredible number of heroes of faith all through uh, history that uh, have followed God, that have uh, listened to God's word, that have trusted him, and they have looked forward to the great things that, that we see now, the, the things of Christ. They saw Christ coming even uh, centuries before he came, and they talked about it, and they wrote about it. And uh, we, we get to see that, and now we are... Uh, perfected with them. We are made complete through all of this, through Jesus Christ. And so the writer starts off talking about that cloud of witnesses. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, if, if we've got all this uh, incredible um, these incredible examples of people of faith, um, surely they can't all be wrong. And it gives me great encouragement, uh, and I hope it does you too, to, uh, to put aside all the things that are, are dragging you down and run that race with an endurance. Uh, I see things like in Romans chapter 13, verse 12, it says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. If you look back over in Galatians chapter 5, you see the, the comparison of uh, deeds of the flesh versus the deeds of the Spirit. Let's put off those deeds of the flesh and put on the deeds of, of the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's interesting that Paul 
uses the analogy of running a race. And that's kind of like uh, what this is. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so, that, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Um, so uh, let's run the race with endurance. And then he says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I love that song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim through the wonderful grace that he displays in his face. He mentions this, the perfecter and founder of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne. Uh, being found in human form, he humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It says the joy that was set before him. That joy that was set before him is right there in the, the last part of that verse. It says, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's, that's what he was looking forward to for the joy that was set before him and the joy that our sins would be forgiven as well. That was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Uh, I, I, I just, it's hard to imagine. I've seen videos of this and displayed in movies of, of uh, Christ being laid on a cross and um, his hands and feet nailed to that cross. And it's just a horrible sight to watch. I can't imagine the pain and, and uh, the things that Christ had to endure on the cross for us. But the most horrible thing was he had to endure the sins of all mankind. Horrible. Uh, despising the shame, the shame, uh, this is interesting, in De Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Is defiled, is, is uh, cursed by God. That's uh, He endured the shame. All the people that were around him, uh, that were making fun of him, uh, that were laughing at him, that were yelling insults at him, um, all of the, the beatings and, and all of that, it's just a, a horrible thing that he endured, and he is now seated at the right hand of God for us. So he says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility toward himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Uh, Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I see a lot of people not giving up, and I see a lot of people uh, doing good, uh, and, and they're not growing weary in it. They just continue to do good things. That's awesome stuff. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And I'm going to read all of this here because it, it's a fairly long uh, uh, discussion. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, uh, sons of God? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, 
For what son is there uh, whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, uh, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness uh, to those who have been trained by it. So when I think of discipline, uh, what is discipline? Uh, Discipline is actually training. Uh, if you look at the word disciple, um, a disciple of Christ, that's one who follows Christ. How do they follow Christ? Uh, they are trained by Christ. They are taught by Christ. Uh, look at the, the uh, apostles. They were with Christ for three years, and they were being trained uh, to take the gospel into the, all the world. Uh, an incredible uh, story of discipline there. We look at the plight of the Jewish Christians to whom this letter was written, and also the plight uh, of us today. Uh, Why does God allow these things to happen? Uh, We say uh, say a lot of things that happen. We say, why did God let that happen? Uh, And and I don't know. Uh, There are a lot of things that I know that God controls. If you look at uh, um, Jesus before Pilate, uh, and Jesus told Pilate, says, you would have no authority if it weren't for my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, So we see that um, um, discipline can be training, it can be good, it can be bad. I see things that, uh, uh, like the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, uh, that uh, it says, "In in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring to them to an end, and it shall stand forever. What he's talking about there was that kingdom that we look back on, the, the um, Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Roman Empire that came along, and then the kingdom of God that will break all of those into pieces. So we are, uh, in, in this letter, uh, at this time, uh, the time frame of this letter, right in the middle of the Roman occupation, and these people are having to endure uh, hardships from the Romans. They're having to endure hardships from the, uh, actually, so many of the Jewish leaders, and also from those that had, had uh, sold out and become tax collectors that were bringing hardships on the Jewish Christians. And so... This was uh, prophesied that this is coming, uh, and, and God knew about this. Daniel knew about this. Why is this happening? It's just about to happen, the der- destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, so that the old covenant is gone. There no longer is any sacrifice uh, for sins. There's the, uh, the, the true sacrifice for sin was Jesus Christ. He now is our high priest. No longer shall these other things uh, be in place. And that is because of the Roman occupation. The Romans actually destroyed the temple and the Jerusalem. So they're having to endure hardships because of the plans of God. Isn't that amazing? So I look at uh, discipline in a, a, a various ways. Uh, God disciplines us uh, by training us through his word. He's given us uh, the Bible, uh, his holy word, that is a real strength to us. And it tells us how to live. It tells us how to treat one another. It tells us how to get to heaven. It tells us about heaven. It tells us about hell. Uh, and it tells us, about God. It shows us God through Jesus Christ, and it shows us God through uh, all of his creation. So we look at testing. uh, In in Exodus chapter 20, it says that all the people saw that they were, God uh, 
wanted Moses to bring them together, and he did at the Mount Sinai, and he says, all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, we, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Uh, so I think that um, uh, we we have uh, God disciplines us through testing. Uh, I, I look at the parable of the talents uh, that Jesus taught, and that's that was a test. Uh, he gave talents to the five and to the two, and and to the uh, one uh, what one of the persons he gave a uh, one talent, and the two, and the five talent men went out and 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 they. They just uh, increased their talents. They they produced the one talent man did not produce, and that uh, person, uh, that one talent man, was cast into uh, uh, the 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 abyss where there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Which is wow! I uh, don't want to be there. So we get training through God's word, uh, Deuteronomy chapter eight verse five. Then. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. You stray away from God's word and and um, I believe you will be disciplined. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Um, there are examples. Um, I think one of the interesting ones is the story of Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, when, when Nebuchadnezzar would not uh, glorify God, he would not honor God, he would not, he would not recognize God uh, for who he is. So God caused him to wander, uh, uh, wander around on his hands and knees like a, like a cow eating uh, grass for food for seven years until Nebuchadnezzar came to the point where he acknowledged God as the creator of the universe. He acknowledged the glory of God, and, uh, um, and he was restored uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, his head of the kingdom of the Babylonians. So that was, uh, uh, he was certainly uh, disciplined there. Also the prodigal son, I think of that story, and I, that's an interesting one about uh, knowing um, the good stuff and giving it up. So the prodigal son uh, had all the wealth. He had uh, uh, a great place to live. He had a great father. He had a great brother. And he wanted his inheritance, and he went off, and he and he threw it all away. And he had to come to his senses by by living uh, in a pigsty, eating corn uh, corn cobs with the pigs. So James puts it this way: He says, "Count it all joy, my brothers, when you endure uh, trials of various kinds, uh, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness." Um, he he says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, you will not see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble by it. Many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So during this trying time that we're in, uh, with having to wear face masks everywhere, uh, not being able to meet as a church, we have found ways to do that in a parking lot service, which is awesome. Um... Uh, Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees uh, when times of trouble hit. 
Why? Because he says, you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice of those words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. I just read that to you from Exodus chapter 20. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So we, we see another uh, example of um, heavenly things versus earthly things. Uh, remember, we talked about the tabernacle, uh, that it, it was a shadow of, of uh, heavenly things. Uh, the Holy of Holies that uh, uh, is the place before God now instead of in, in some uh, room inside the tabernacle. And the holy place, which is heaven, which is also uh, within the tabernacle on the, on the earthly place. And priests, and uh, we are priests now uh, that are offering spiritual sacrifices daily. And also the high priest, which is Jesus Christ now, that uh, makes intercession for us before God. This is incredible stuff that we have all we have seen throughout the book of, of Hebrews. And now he, he talks about this physical mountain that the people were before. And it was so terrifying uh, that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. What is Mount Zion? It's the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels and festal gathering. Uh, myriads of angels, it says in some, some uh, uh, translations. The city of the living God with angels. It's the assembly of the firstborn. Uh, we are those firstborn. When it talks about the firstborn, it's uh, uh, Jesus was previously, previously called the uh, firstborn son in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, where here his um, uh, followers, which is us, are also granted uh, an inheritance as if we were the firstborn. Uh, so that is the assembly of the firstborn. When we meet uh, together on Sunday morning, do you realize that there are millions of people all over the world that are, are honoring God, they're remembering Jesus Christ, uh, and we are together with them. And it says, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So we look around and we see all these millions of people that are doing what we're doing, that are honoring God, that, that their faith, so be strengthened by that, by all of the people that are, that, that are thinking like you do, that believe like you do. So be strengthened by that. So what about this sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel? Uh, that was kind of interesting to me. Uh, the, the blood of Abel does not remove sin. Only Jesus' blood brings forgiveness and atonement. So that's why it's, it's better. It's interesting that Abel was uh, talked about there. So what happens if we refuse? Uh, do not refuse God. Do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned him on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. When God spoke to the people and uh, he was there, uh, he told, talked to Moses and Moses talked for God to the people and they didn't listen. So what happened? An entire Israelite generation perished in the desert. They did not get to see the promised land of Canaan. Listen to God. You want to see the promised land. He says, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Oh, boy. So, 
Uh, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's from Luke chapter 21, verse 33. A Revelation eleven fifteen says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall remain forever and ever. First John two seventeen, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Those things uh, will be shaken that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. That's, that's us. That's the kingdom of God. So are you thankful for all of that? I hope so. Praise God that there's a kingdom that will remain forever. As we read back in Daniel chapter 2, uh, when he said that a kingdom was coming that would last forever, and that we're in it. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Worship God with reverence and awe every day of your life. Thank you for listening. I pray that this has been encouraging to you. I love the view of, of the church with the, all the angels, with Jesus, with God, with all the saints. Um, I love all of that. And I hope that was an encouragement to you as well. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week for Chapter 13. Have a great week.